As we acknowledge the land on this Thanksgiving Sunday, let's see if we can invite gratitude more intentionally into this spiritual practice. Begin by slowing down, allowing yourself to ground where you are. I invite you to pause and take a breath and to feel your body held, anchored here in this place, wherever you may be. And noticing gravity, we can then shift and feel the land itself and feel how it supports us. What kind of life could we have without this land? Gratitude is a natural response. And we recognize that this land has been home to indigenous peoples for thousands of years. They were stewards of this land long before European settlers came and radically altered their lives and the life of the land itself. Indigenous peoples continue to care for this land, and we have much to be grateful for and much to learn. We're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. We are grateful to them. We are indebted to them. We honor the light of creation alive in their hearts. The light of Christ here is one and the same, and it calls us to walk in the way of the peacemaker. We make the road by walking, one step at a time, listening and learning. In gratitude for our abundance, we are called to support one another as we journey, living in harmony with creation. May this light remind us to walk faithfully and thankfully in the way of Jesus.
what a gift that was. And I'm so glad that you're part of this worship experience for us to worship together. Wherever you are, whatever time of day, we are making space to draw close to God. And you're part of this church family that doesn't think the same, vote the same, or love the same, but is making its way as followers of Jesus. We are grateful for you and the ways you share these messages of hope online, and your presence matters. Come, ye thankful people, come. of Thanksgiving when we gather, we are drawn to the communion table where there are beautiful flowers placed this day in honor of Ann Nugent's father who's in the hospital. And so we give thanks that those flowers will share God's love to someone in our church community in need in the days to come. For now, the light of healing is with us and the lights of the cloud of witnesses is here. I wonder who it is that taught you to be grateful, who showed you about manners and saying please and thank you or to live from a spirit of gratitude. They are with us in this time and they encourage us to move into the ways 
of walking the path of peace. The living God is with us and with all creation. A passage from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. May we be equipped by these words to walk in love for God, ourselves, our neighbors, all people, and all creation. What does God require? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself down before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my womb for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. I wonder what God is asking of me this Thanksgiving Sunday. I wonder what God is asking of you. I wonder what God is asking of us. May the ask of us to do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God, resonate into hearing two scripture stories from Genesis. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. This week, in chapter 7, in the book we're following together, We Make the Road by Walking, we come to two ancient stories. We meet Abram and Sarai after their names have been changed. We meet them in the morning, where three strangers have come out of the desert, and Abraham greets them, 
and Sarah feeds them. And as they are sharing a meal together, the three strangers say to Abraham and Sarah that they will become parents. And they laugh. For by now, Abraham and Sarah are old and full of years. Sarah laughs to herself, but you know what happened? Just a little while later, they had a baby boy. And in their language, his name was Isaac, which means laughter. And I can only imagine what it felt like for them to hold him, to watch him grow. And then a story comes to us in Scripture may be familiar or you may be hearing it for the first time. For Isaac grew, and when he was a boy, God tested his father Abraham. God appeared to Abraham and said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him as a burnt offering upon the mountain. The next day, Abraham cut wood and took a donkey, two helpers and his son, and began to walk towards the mountain. On the third day, they could see it. Abraham told his helpers to stay there with his donkey, and the boy and he are going over there to worship. And then we'll come back to you, he said. He and Isaac went on alone. Isaac carried the wood for the offering, and Abraham carried a bowl of fire and a knife. Isaac said, here is the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb, father, for the offering? And Abraham said, God will provide. And they kept walking together. When they came to the place for the sacrifice, Abraham tied up Isaac. He picked up a knife and was about to kill him for the sacrifice when an angel came and said, No, you do not need to do this. Then Abraham looked, and there was a ram caught in the bushes. God provided the ram for the sacrifice. Abraham untied Isaac, and they went down the mountain. The angel called to him again and says, God says, I will make you the father of a great family, as many of the grains of sand in the desert and the stars in the sky. And I will make of you a great blessing. All nations on earth will be themselves blessed through your descendants because you listen to me. I wonder if you've heard this story before. I wonder if you'd rather stay in the first part and ignore the last. I wonder if there's a part of the story that's most important. I wonder what part you could take out of the story and still have all you need. And today, I wonder what part of this story is about you. This story this story for Thanksgiving Sunday, and yet the act of giving thanks, sometimes tied with the spiritual ancient practice of offering sacrifice, has been part of our religious history, a part we may choose to ignore or because our worldview has shifted, not use that lens to look at our stories. Today, I am thankful for writers and theologians who've gone before me and spent more time mining the power of this story for today. Rob Bell, writer of What is the Bible, invites us to first look at the history of religion, not just open our scripture and read it with our own lens. So let's try and do it in a couple minutes or less. Early humans came to the realization that their survival as a species was dependent on things like food and water. And for food to grow, it needs sun and water in proper proportion. Too much water, things wash away. Not enough, and plants die. In this season of harvest, our farmers and gardeners know that all too well. Too much sun and plants wilt. Not enough, and they die as well. These basic observations about life brought people to the conclusion that they were dependent on some unseen force they could not control for their survival. It was a time of big realization. And the belief, how they connected the dots, arose that these forces that help things to grow or live are either on your side or they aren't. 
And how do you keep these forces on your side? The next time you have a harvest, you take a portion of the harvest and you offer it on an altar as a sign of gratitude because you need the unseen forces, the gods or the goddesses on your side. Now imagine what happened when people would offer a sacrifice, but then it didn't rain or the sun didn't shine or their animals still got diseases or they were unable to have children. Logically, they concluded they didn't offer enough. And so they offered more and more and more. Because what religion had built into it from the very beginning was something called anxiety. You never knew where you stood with the gods. The gods could be angry or demanding. And if you didn't please them, They could punish you by bringing calamity. But what if things went well? What if it rained just the right amount and the sun shined just the right amount? What if it appeared that the gods are pleased with you? Well, then you'd need to offer them thanks. But how would you ever properly know how grateful you were? How would they know in how you showed them? How would you know that you'd offered enough to say thank you? If things went well, you never know if you'd been grateful enough. If things didn't go well, then clearly you hadn't done enough. Anxiety either way. And whether things went well or not, the answer was always sacrifice more. Give more. Offer more. I wonder if you've ever been in a relationship where you didn't know where you stood and you thought if you could just give more, offer more, that it might be enough. Because in that time, you never knew where you stood with the gods. And so you'd offer part of your crop and then you'd offer a goat and maybe a lamb, maybe a cow and then maybe a few cows and maybe some birds. And the very nature of early religion is that everything escalated because in your anxiety to please the gods, you kept having to offer more. And what's the most valuable thing that you could offer the gods to show them how serious you were about earning their favor in order to survive? A child? Of course. Can you see how child sacrifice lurks on the edges of the Old Testament? is found in other practices of early religion. It's where religion took you, to the place where you'd offer what's most valuable to you. When God tells Abraham in this story to offer his son, Abraham isn't shocked or angry. Abraham gets right to it. He gets up, he gathers the wood, he gets his donkey, he heads out. Of course, that's how Abraham understood religion worked. The gods demanded of you what was most valuable. And if you didn't give it, you'd pay the price. That's what the world looked like at this time. So Abraham sets out. Imagine what he's thinking about on the three-day journey. He reaches that place on the third day. And Abraham told his helpers to stay there with the donkey, for the boy and I are going over there to worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham tells his helpers that he's going off to sacrifice his son, but we'll be back. Now, you may have heard another sermon on this topic before. You may have heard it told to you in Sunday school, or you may have heard people talk about why they don't talk about it, why they don't read it. God telling Abraham to offer his son so he does it, or at least proves that he would do it. The sermon often is interpreted as, what would you do to show how much you trust in God? As they walk up the mountain, Isaac asks Abraham where the sacrifice will come from. It's the worst part of the story, isn't it? Because in the standard reading of the story, Isaac's going to his death because his dad loves God so much. Come on. What kind of God would ask a man to sacrifice his own son? 
in this story, not this one. The other gods may demand your firstborn, but not this God. And then Abraham gets ready to offer his son, but he doesn't because God stops him. And then he offers a ram instead. End of story. Except then an angel shows up and says, Abraham, you're going to be blessed. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. And then people often connect the dots that Abraham being willing to kill his own son leads to the blessing. And maybe today we should pause and look at it another way. Because this story is like the other stories about God's who are never satisfied. And the first audience for this story would have heard it before and it would have been familiar. But then it's not. The story takes a shocking turn that comes out of nowhere. This God disrupts the familiarity of how the world works by interrupting the sacrifices. Until now, the gods would take everything picture an early audience gasping what this god stopped the sacrifice gods just don't do that but for abraham who knows god in this story god provides worship and sacrifice was always about you giving to the gods but this story is about God giving to Abraham. A God who gives was unknown. A God who provides is mind-blowing. And this isn't a story about what Abraham does for God. It's a story about what God does for Abraham. It's new. It's groundbreaking. It's a story about a God who doesn't demand anything, a God who doesn't take away, but a God who gives and blesses. And we might have missed it because we want to skip over the hard parts. And Abraham at the end is told that God's just getting started. It's not just a one-time thing. That God's going to bless Abraham with such love and favor that through Abraham, everything on earth is going to be blessed. Everybody on earth, blessed with life. This isn't God angry or demanding or unleashing wrath. This is God's intention to bless. This is Abraham invited to trust, to have faith, to live into the promises. Can you see how this was a transformative story? A game-changing story? Can you see why people told this story? Can you see why it lasted? Can you think of any other stories about a son who was as good as dead for three days, but then lived in such a way that the story about him confronting the conventional wisdom of the day that got the gods angry with the insistence that God blesses and gives and provides and the invitation that all that's left to do is trust that God is really like that. In this season of Thanksgiving, can we be alive to seeing the story in a new way? Even our own story that we're so hooked into about how it's played out? Can we be alive to this wisdom because it's not too late to notice? Can we be prepared for our minds to be blown and to be loved by a God who blesses us for the blessing of others? Let's look for the places where God provides, a God who gives and blesses, and a God who invites us to have a grateful heart.
Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for me. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for me. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for me. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what has done for us. Give thanks. Give thanks. Friends, I invite you to join me now in a prayer of thanksgiving. We give you thanks, God, for blessing us with the gifts of creation, for water and light, for land and air, each in balance. And amidst this wonder, you made us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. We thank you for this opportunity and this responsibility we celebrate the beauty and bounty of your good earth, God. Glorious blue skies and blazing autumn colors, fields ripe for harvest, gardens overflowing with goodness. For our daily food, for our homes, families, and friends, we thank you, God. For loving hearts and discerning minds, we thank you, God. For all who live in peace, justice, and truth. We thank you, God. Move our hearts to thankfulness, not just because of what we have, but because of who has us, because of whose we are. And may our thanksgiving be expressed not only in feasting, but in sharing, not only in passive enjoyment, but in active service, not only in annual observance, but in daily living. Through our gratitude, may we be inspired and equipped to offer our lives to your service, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you, our God. We pray that you will bless us to bless others. And may we do this following in Jesus' way as we sing together in prayer.
I couldn't think of a better response than to offer what we have. We can imagine our ancestors singing, bringing in the sheaves, and so we offer what we've received back to God today, knowing it will be received with love and gratitude for the ways we're offering in new ways online, uh, virtually, e-transferring to office at islingtonunited.org, ways that we are sharing what we have into our community to make a difference. The offering will now be received on this Thanksgiving Day.
I'm so grateful for that piece of music that calls us to now and for the ways that you've given generously and for the ways we can still participate as community of faith through regular meditation, through uh, Bible study, through the book club that's coming, that wide circumference of love, a novel to delve into. We also look to new ways that we can be the church in this time. But don't forget, the food bank is continuing to feed people, and Dave and Carol Lawton are leading that team in a safe way. I am also excited for you to join us after on Facebook Live so we can share the good news and gratitudes and peace of this day. Our prayers are with our church family, and we are grateful to finish this worship with our closing hymn, We Plow the Fields and Scatter. the snow in winter, the warmth to swell the grain, the breezes and the sunshine and soft refreshing rain. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. We thank you, God, for all from this place surrounded by the unconditional love of God who gives back to us and following in the way of Christ who risked for that love and may the spirit find you noticing gratitude in the little things and in the big things go in peace amen